Hi everyone, welcome back to the, our devotion time. Today is October 14th and our devotion is titled A Life of Victory from Romans 8, 35 and 37. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory today. We open our hearts and our ears to hear your word, and we ask that you would plant that seed deeply rooted into our hearts, that it would not be snatched away. We praise you and thank you for your blessed word today, Lord. We love you so much. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would anoint me with the words to speak, and I give you praise and glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. The miracle mop promised to be the solution for every mopping mess. No more stubborn stains, stuck on grime, or back-breaking, scrubbing, and scouring. The solution was simple and cheap. Such assurance, assurances tug at our pocketbooks because, well, life is messy, and sometimes the shortcut's downright tantalizing. But we know it's never that easy. The mop doesn't push itself, after all. It's tempting to take shortcuts, but a life of victory isn't a life without disappointment or hard work. Jesus promised us trials and difficulties as we follow him. Jesus' promise was meant to prepare us for the rejection, bitterness, and hatred we would encounter. Jesus also promised us grace, strength, hope, and victory. Don't be deceived to think that good works, prayers, or even faith will produce a life of ease and earthly blessing. Showered down from above, we have one promise of victory, and that is the saving love of Jesus Christ. We have talked about this before, and I'm very adamant in teaching people that we cannot expect to have nothing ever go wrong, and that there's never going to be any challenges, and that life's going to be a breeze, and because we're saved. And that is like the worst thing that we can believe about walking with God. Um, and it's just a huge fat lie. It's not true. You know, God tells us openly that we will have to work out our own salvation, that we're going to have times of trouble, that we're going to struggle in this life, and that He is going to be right there with us. I always tell people, you know, if you don't accept Christ and you're walking through life by yourself, you're alone, and you're having to deal with the onslaught of what this world brings at us, at each of us. But if you accept Christ, you will still have problems. You will still have troubles in this life, but you will never be alone again. And you will have someone in your corner who's fighting for you and who is your best friend and who loves you. He created you and he wants the best for you. So he's going to be there working those things out, you know, according to his will and for your good. And I would much rather have him in my corner than not. <laughs> Let's go over to Philippians 2, 12 and 13. And we're going to read about that very thing. Working out our salvation. It says in verse 12 of chapter 2, Philippians. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Okay, the Lord is working in us, and as we seek to grow stronger in our relationship with him, as we deny our flesh, as we give our hearts and surrender to him, he is working everything out according to his will and to his good pleasure because we were created to bring pleasure to God, you know. That's why we're here. People want to know what their purpose is? Seek it in the word of God because it tells us clearly we were made for him. We were made for his pleasure. We are his children. It's just like when we have children and we get to find pleasure in them. We enjoy them, hopefully, for the most part. And God enjoys the pleasure of, of being our Father. And so we need to be trusting in Him. And 
we cannot expect pastors or teachers to be working our salvation out. You know, it's just what Paul was saying here. He says, even as you did it when I'm there, do it even more. Do it much more, he says, in my absence. So in other words, live righteous lives in my presence, yes, but even much more seek righteousness. Seek to live out and work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Don't take it for granted. Don't just, you know, we talked yesterday or the day before about God's word um, not being an option. You know, serving the Lord and learning about our God and spending time with him in his word and becoming more and more like Christ. These are not optional things for a Christian. And if we treat them as such, we're going to find our faith shipwrecked. And again, I am living proof that you can shipwreck your faith. I've done it. And by God's grace, he held on to my hand as I made my way through the wreckage and brought me back. Otherwise, I wouldn't have met any of you. He is so good, you guys. You know, I used to tell the youth group that I would teach, um, different youth groups that I've taught. I used to always tell them, don't run away from the altar of God. Stay there. Because eventually he's going to bring you back and you may have gone through all kinds of things that were never, you know, never necessary in your lives. Stay close to him. We talked about this yesterday or, or the day before. I can't remember. Yeah, the day before. Continually, continuing in your relationship with God. It's a daily life choice. And we work it out with fear and trembling every single day growing and transforming our minds, offering up our bodies as living sacrifices, denying self and surrendering to God. And it's worth it because the joy that you will receive from the Holy Spirit who dwells in your heart, the, the satisfaction of feeling your God's presence and his pleasure in your life, seeing the victories over things that you never would have had victory over seeing yourself prosper in your ways. And it doesn't always mean things, but it can mean things. You know, there's such, there's such reward in loving God. Enjoy your relationship with him. Let's go over to John chapter 16. And we're going to go to verse 33. Jesus says, these things I've spoken to you. And we've, we've read this a lot because it, it, our, our messages in our devotion kind of bring us back to this kind of message. But Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You know, I know that many of you are going through some things right now that are just tearing your heart apart. But the Lord, He never promised you wouldn't go through those things. Don't turn away from Him in the challenging times because He is there and He wants to help you through them and He wants to get you through them quicker than you would get through them without Him. He doesn't want you to get caught up in the cycle of muttering and complaining and being upset and being broken and, and self-pity and all the things that we as human beings do get ourselves caught up in when we're going through something. Don't get caught up in all that because God has a better plan and he needs your cooperation, but he has a better plan. So whatever it is, surrender it to God and let him work things out for you. Let's go over to Hebrews 12. We're going to be, read a little bit more than we usually usually do here. I wanted to read this whole section because I really I want us to focus on being okay with going through things in this life and surrendering everything to him. Like I was talking to you a couple weeks about ago about um you know, surrendering our children, our spouse, our health, our finances, our jobs, our careers, surrendering ourselves, who we think we are and who God knows we are, surrendering all of that and saying, Lord, no, no matter what happens to me in this life, I know that you're on the other side. And so because you're my portion, I'm going to be okay. 
Let's read chapter 12, verses 1, and we're going to go all the way through 11. Because this is talking about enduring hardships, and it's talking about, it says here, the race of faith, exhortation to faith and godliness. And, and it's talking about the discipline of God and the chastising of God. And we've read this recently, but we're going to read this whole section because Jesus was chastised by God on the cross, okay, for our for our eternal salvation. Let's read. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded now, right before this, I sorry to interrupt myself, but right before this, he had been talking about the faith, heroes of faith, okay? And he says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded so by so great, by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus as our example, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, I want you to look at that. We're going to read on, but I want you to look at that. Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, we're to look at him as an example, okay? And it says that he saw the cross as joy. He endured the most horrific style of death that anyone can endure with joy. He saw it for the joy that was set before him. Who was the joy? You. Me. We were the joy that was set before him. And it says, after the cross... He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God as our Savior. It's, it's intense when you think about it. That's what I mean. On the other side of every, everything you dedicate to God, everything you give up to Him, okay? Even if He chose to take it all away, on the other side of the cross is His right hand. He is our portion. On the other side of that cross, Jesus is waiting for us. So no matter what we endure in this life, and it's not easy to say this because I know that I'm going to endure more things in my life. I've already endured a lot. <laughs> All of us have. But there are certain things in our lives that we get afraid to surrender to God. We are afraid to surrender our kids or we're afraid to surrender our own life, our lifestyle, maybe. And God says, even if you had to endure, I'm on the other side of the enduring. I'm on the other side of this valley that you're looking at. Cross it with me. Because I've already gave you the victory. You're going to have to go through some things because that's what makes you grow. But I'm on the other side of it. Now let's go on. Verse 3. For consider him, again Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So in other words, let's think about Jesus and what he endured before we go giving in to self-pity. Before we start giving in to weariness and discouragement in our minds. He says, you've not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. In other words, you haven't been asked to give your life. You haven't been asked to be martyred. You've not shed a drop of blood for the gospel. But Jesus did. He says, and you've forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. Now this is, this is where we go into talking about what God the Father is doing through all those situations we endure. Okay? It says, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. So in other words, in this life, when you go through situations, let God train you up. Let him strengthen you. Because if you don't, you're going to be a weak person. You're going to be a weak human being who has no ability to have character or integrity. Do you see what I'm saying? You have to go through things in this life to gain wisdom, to gain understanding. You have to go through things in this life to gain integrity, to gain re, um, the responsibility that we need, to gain the character, to even sustain all of those things. 
And he says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? So if you're a parent, you know that there's times when you, because you love your children, you have to teach them. And it's not pleasurable to them at the time. He says, but if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. God doesn't chasten the wicked. He doesn't. He doesn't. He do, they're not his children. Not yet. Not until they've accepted the death and resurrection of Jesus as, as their Savior. So he doesn't bother to chasten them because they're illegitimate. They're not really his sons. But it says, furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. True. When you're when your mother or your father corrected you as children, it, it caused and brought forth respect in them, toward them, right? And same with your kids. So shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. He wants us to be partakers of his holiness. He wants us to be at his right hand. He wants us <laughs> to be where Jesus is. He wants us there with him in eternity, in a heavenly domain where we'll never, ever have anything in the, that we've had in this life, the evil that we've dealt with, where we're going to have perfection surrounding us, the beauty of our God and our Father, where we're going to have a world that's glorious, things that we can't even imagine, things that haven't been seen or heard or thought of. That's what he wants for us. He wants us to be partakers of his own holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. So when you're going through situations in this life, stop for a moment before you react. Stop and think and say, Father, what do you want me to learn through this? How do you want me to grow? You know, as an example, I always try to give you guys examples out of my own life. Yesterday we found out that the homeowner who wants to sell the house and does still uh, out of, you know, it's been eight weeks since he announced the house was for sale. He's only had one person view it, uh, one couple. And so I think we think he got a wild hair and decided, well, I'll go ahead and finish that front room like I had planned. And then that way uh, it'll bring more value to the house. So he informs us yesterday, he's still going to take that room away from us and expects us to move all of our stuff into that dirty old garage. And I went in, you know, to the bathroom and Courtney immediately began to respond to him on a text um, on my phone because he was texting with me and I went in and took my shower and when I was in there, I was starting, I started to react, I started to, to say a few things out loud because I talk to myself when I'm upset. I'm sure most of us do and I started to talk to him, the owner of the house and say a few things and then I stopped myself and I said, Father God, what is it you want me to see here? And how do you want me to respond to this? Because I am about to go into anger and I don't want that. And do you know, after that, I mean, I look back on yesterday evening and it was like, I just had peace. I just, I just kept at peace. It was because I turned and I, I cried out to the Lord, but he was chastening. He's chastening us on these things because we need to learn how to um, trust in him. That's the biggest thing. He's in control of this house. He's in control of the situation. I and Cordy need to trust God that he's dealing with this owner, that he's going to deal with the situation and put it into his hands. And so he chastened me to stop and say, whoa, don't do that. You know, the situation is a chastening, but it's, it's for me, it's a growth of who I am as, as a person. It's a growth in my character. And I'm, I'm up for that. I'm happy about that because I know that as I learn to walk by faith and not by sight, as I learn to trust in my God, 
I'm becoming stronger and stronger. I'm becoming like Jesus. Because when Jesus hung on that cross, what did he pray before he went on that cross? In the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, Father, your will be done, not mine. I, if, it be, if, if, there, if there be any other way to deal with this, Father, please. And he asked him three times because he was not looking forward to, to going on that cross. But then he had a change of heart because he gave it to God. He surrendered his life to the Lord. And he said, no matter what, Father, if it's still your will for me to take this punishment, then so be it. And I will do it with joy. And he made that choice. And you have salvation because he made that choice. And so do I. Amen. Mm. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Let's pray. Father God, <laughs> your love is victorious in all situations. We say today that we are willing to scrub and scour in this life. We don't want to take shortcuts. Lord, give us eyes to see the things that matter and the strength to go after them. Help us to see things through your eyes and help us to walk in that peace that passes understanding that's given only by the grace of your Holy Spirit. Father, we love you. There's not enough words in our vocabulary to describe how much we love you. But we give you all of the glory from our lives. We give you all credit for everything is due to you. We surrender our lives to you today, Father and ask that you would only help us to do what you've given us to do with a good attitude, with a heart full of desire for you and a desire to learn and grow. We give you all praise and glory today in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a good lesson. I feel like I've fed myself today. <laughs> praise God. I love you, and I will see you tomorrow. Thank you for being with me again. Thank you always for being with me, you guys. Take care. Bye-bye.